and tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Disclaimer. Horror Hill is a horror anthology podcast bringing you scary stories from all corners of the internet and beyond. As such, certain stories include content that some listeners might find offensive. In particular, tonight's story features multiple mentions of sexual assault. Listener discretion is advised. Good evening, listeners, and welcome to Season 9 of Horror Hill. I'm your host, Eric Peabody, and I'd like to open tonight's episode by thanking everyone that listened to our coverage of The Events at Porth Farm by Ted Klein. It's an all-time favorite of mine, and getting to share it with you has warmed my cold, rotten heart. If you haven't listened to it yet, check out episodes 23 and 24 of season 8. Rolling straight through into season 9, I thought that we'd modernize things a bit while still staying in the fiction-about-fiction fiction realm. Instead of an English professor reading gothic tales in the early 1970s, tonight's story is about a teenaged girl who writes online reviews for Goodreads. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, Goodreads is a site that lets users catalog their book libraries, write reviews, etc. Our heroine, Karen, is one of the most prolific reviewers on the site, focusing on a subgenre called Monster Erotica. After winning a free copy of a short story collection, Karen starts receiving increasingly insistent messages from its author, demanding that she review the book. Karen dismisses these as just being another interaction with another internet creep, but not every jerk online is content to just sit in their basement and send angry messages. This tale, written by J.R. Hamantaschen, is titled, Soon Enough, This Will Essentially Be a True Story. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to help support Horror Hill and also remove these pesky ads, head over to ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. You'll get instant access to hundreds of ad-free stories, and we can scale back some of our uh, less savory means of generating money for the show. By the way, you don't happen to still have all of your organs, do you? And now, 
from author J. R. Hamantosh and I give you. Soon enough, this will essentially be a true story. It was the easiest thing to do, so she did it. Click, and she was entered into another Goodreads giveaway. She'd entered about ten giveaways in the last couple of minutes, just entering with nothing more than a click, to win whatever seemed even marginally interesting, meaning something dark, something weird, something bizarre. Click, click, click. If anyone ever wrote a biography about her, they'd have to come up with different words for click. Here was a Penguin reissue of some Edgar Allan Poe stories, stories that were available for free online and that she already owned, but she didn't see any harm in entering the giveaway anyway. It was just a click away. Click. Give me convenience or give me death. The band The Dead Kennedys had named their compilation of rarities, their dig at 1980s consumer culture. That album was released back in 1985, years and years before she was even born. What had they been satirizing? Mail-order catalogs? What was that in a world where she canvassed a digital aggregator for free books, free books provided by authors so eager for readers that they even paid their own shipping costs, while simultaneously pirating four albums off Soulseek and skimming through her friends' online pictures of food shots and exaggerated expressions. Give me convenience or give me death, indeed. She checked her Goodreads tally. She'd entered about 15 giveaways, thought, well, this is enough empty-minded clicking for one day, and logged off. It was about 2.30 p.m. on an unassuming school day. Karen was home alone in her room, had been for approximately an hour. Ah, the perks of being a high school senior. If you couldn't set yourself up with an easy-peasy schedule, they should demote you back to freshmen. So much free time, yet her room still so messy. Maybe she'd spend her afternoon conquering Heap Mountain, as she and her mother dubbed the lump of clothes, accessories, books, and accumulated detritus that gathered around her bed. Her mother would be pleasantly surprised and impressed, and that would be her strongest reason for doing it. But still, she didn't. No reason why not. She should. She wanted to. But she didn't. Her rickety old phone buzzed. She checked the text. Yo, yo, biatch, swingin' by. It was Rose, her best friend and hetero life partner. Karen was impressed that Rose had bothered to spell out biatch, put in the little hyphen and everything. That's the type of care and dedication that makes someone a best friend. Coolio, in the lair, astride Heap Mountain, stop in, she texted back. Good thing she didn't get started on cleaning up her room. She would have been interrupted anyway, she fake thought. Getting to work on stabilizing Heap Mountain remained the insurmountable task. That's because Heap Mountain never updated. It was always the same. Maybe if cleaning incorporated clicking. She went on Songza for a doer but upbeat music mix, and on came Crawl by the Alkaline Trio. She bobbed along, keeping rhythm. She uploaded her just-finished Goodreads review. It had been almost 48 hours since her last update. She was in the top 20 in the United States on Goodreads for her prolific and well-liked reviews. Literally, the algorithm that ranked reviewers depended on how many people clicked like on her reviews. Yeah, top 20 reviewer, at 20th, she imagined Rose saying, something she'd probably said in the past. Still the top 20th, she imagined shooting back gleefully. She was damn impressed with herself. Top 20 for the United States was an achievement. There was a lot of competition. America created the online marketplace for attempts at attention getting. If she were in Latvia or something, she'd certainly be taking the number one spot. Hobbies were getting more and more niche. Posting online reviews on Goodreads was hers. 
She posted the review and closed the website, with the full knowledge that she'd be back online in about 10 minutes. Or one minute, who was she kidding? To see how many likes, tweets, and comments she'd amassed. Crawl played again. She said it on repeat. She was like that. She loved hearing the same thing, refreshing the same pages. Whatever controls the circuitry of satisfaction and pleasures, well, that was what got her off. 15 minutes, 5 refreshes, 11 individual comments, 14 likes, and 2 profile picture changes later, Rose arrived. Can't believe how strange it is to be anything at all. Karen sung along with Neutral Milk Hotel, another repeat favorite, as Rose came into the room. Hola, hola. Rose came to Karen's house to and fro as she pleased, essentially another family member. Damn, still good old Clutter Island in here, I see. You didn't lie. Yup, and still can't get Leonardo DiCaprio to sign on. Well, in his defense, you're no Scorsese. Not yet. Rose leaned in and looked at Karen's Goodreads page. Raped by the Raptor. She read the title of the book Karen had just reviewed off Karen's computer screen. Sounds like another Karen-approved classic. Actually, it's Raped by the Reptar. Learn to read, biatch. It's Rugrats fan fiction porn. Rugrats is this old kid's cartoon. Jesus, Lord. You keep sinking lower and lower, don't you? Damn, Karen, you never cease. Don't hate the player. Karen pointed her cursor over a comment that a fan had just left in the last minute or so and read the comment aloud. You sexy goth librarian, you. You never cease to amaze us. She turned to Rose. See? My fans agree with you. I never cease to amaze. And my fans are legion. Rose laughed. That's awesome. Great minds think alike. Serendipity, it must be. Karen replied to the comment, noting her friend Rose had just said the same thing, and clicked like on her own comment. Karen liked being called a sexy goth librarian. Goth librarian was not exactly the look she went for, but was somewhere in the wheelhouse. She didn't see herself as sexy. She instead focused on the 15 pounds or so she felt she could afford to lose. If only clicking was exercise, and cookies and ice cream didn't taste so good. She had natural dark hair, which she kept pulled back. Well-curated outfits of dark colors, tight-fitting enough to suggest the chesty body underneath, which she knowingly accentuated with pendants or necklaces to lead the eyes to the fun parts. Her current profile picture was appropriately gothic and decked out for fall the lower part of her face covered by red and orange crumpled leaves she held up for the camera, only her arch, sharp eyes, and angular lashes visible. And the picture showed off one of the best things about living in Rhode Island, damn good fall foliage. She received a new message on Goodreads. Mmm, why are you hiding behind those leaves, lol? You're too pretty for that. Maybe put the leaves between the boobs, though. That may work better for fall, lol. Groan. On a good week, half of the comments she received were sexualized come-ons, always replete with the, what, me, lols, as if dropping an lol or jk in a comment completely nullified sexual obnoxiousness. The same guy, profile picture showed an avuncular older man with well-styled white hair, had left a couple of comments before, some of them substantive and constructive. She only responded to those worthwhile comments. Eh, she didn't want to ignore him and lose a follower, but still, eh. She oscillated about how to respond. Two more messages popped up. The first message was from the same avuncular old man, an apology of sorts. LOL. Sorry, I didn't mean any offense. Just ignore that. I'm an idiot sometimes. Phew. Problem solved. No prob, she replied. The second message... Oh, shit! She bellowed. She won a Goodreads lottery, which meant she'd get a free physical copy of the book she bid on. She usually only read physical books if she won them, 
With her reading interests, the books were usually free, or at most, 99 cents for a Kindle copy. Not many authors or publishing companies would bother to physically produce copies of the gems in her collection, which included such classics as Mounted by the Monster, the related but far more offensive Mounted by My Masta, I, Horbot, Vampire Fuckfest, The Only Crosses We Respect Are the Ones That Go Inside Us, and That Beguiling Story of Star-Crossed Lovers, the Maiden, and the Deer Gods. She actually did read some respectable fiction, nonfiction, and the like, but those reviews took longer to prepare, and the Goodreads metrics prized quantity. She absentmindedly ended up becoming the ascendant genre erotica reviewer on Goodreads. She was listed as a favorite reviewer on the Monster Erotica chat group, and every related review had a guaranteed fan base of at least 500 pairs of eyeballs. The competition was always nipping at her heels, churning out reviews that were barely more than clickbait gifs and look at me meta hipsterism. The genre she was reviewing, of course, was largely fatuous trash, but she made an effort to separate the wheat from the chaff. I mean, there's something to be said about trash done right. She read up on the book she'd won, The Ardent Aardvark Who Fucks the World and Other Stories by the obviously pseudonymed Katmandu. That was the whole title, which included the author's name for whatever reason, and literally, that was the author's nom de plume, obviously pseudonymed Katmandu. The author's profile picture was of a grey and white tabby cat wearing wide-framed wire glasses, donning a photoshopped, squiggly black line of a smirk. She read the book's description. A serial killer who only targets the most deserving victims, people who don't turn off their phones in movie theaters. An unloved aardvark who, frustrated that his species is unknown to the wider world, becomes whatever he imagines himself to be. A tree who rapes a shrub, only to become America's sweetheart. Ellen Page's boobs, that were digitally created for that video game, gain sentience and haunt her dreams, with sexy results. Plus, Katy Perry and Taylor Swift diking it out and blowing a bunch of dudes while Ashton Kutcher gets set on fire. All this and more, finally in one place. For the first time, after much demand, Katmandu's surviving stories have been collected in one anthology. Not strictly monster erotica, but the type of wallowing genre so bad it's great Kindle-bred trash that should make for a decent review. And she had to give credit where it was due. This guy, well, maybe not a guy, but let's play the odds here, took the time to self-publish the book in a physical format. That boded... Not well, but at least meant something. Perhaps this author put a little more tender love and care into his creations. Oh man, this one's a winner. Rose leaned in, her long neck and limbs crowding out Karen's view of the screen. You just like it because it's written by a cat. Karen pointed to the profile picture. Rose was lithe and cat-like naturally dark-haired and with soulful green eyes, and many a Halloween she donned black tights and black stub earrings and gone as a cat. A good, I'm pretending to be lazy, but this only works because I can sort of pull it off costume. Meow. Karen play scratched at Rose. Rose hissed back, impressively. She'd had practice. Goodreads provided the participating author with the addresses of the contest winners. The author would send out the physical copies and then verify electronically that the copies had been sent. Within five minutes, Goodreads sent her another automated message. Congratulations! We are happy to let you know that, obviously pseudonymed Katmandu, has sent out your contest copy. Happy reading! You are encouraged to write a review, but it's not mandatory. Damn, this cat was an eager beaver. Another email arrived. Subject line, straight from the cat's mouth. Karen, thanks for submitting to my contest, and even better, thanks for winning. 
You are a review rock star. Even if you didn't win, I would have sent you a copy anyway. I knew you had it in you. Holy meowsers, you live in Rhode Island too. I hope you love the book, and we can drink Dells and Sets, and I can eat your clam... er... We can eat clams together. Hope you like it. It's my life's work. I sent it out via Amazon Prime. And remember... Meow! She responded kindly and enthusiastically, ignoring the clam comment, par for the course, and electronically high-fiving him on his love of Dells and asking him where he lived in Little Roadie. She sent him the usual disclaimer, that she had a bunch of other books on the reading queue, so a review may not be forthcoming any time in the near future, but she would definitely make sure to get to his book in due time and post an honest review. <laughs> oh man, what have you gotten yourself into? Rose asked as they got ready for the night. Just another day in the life. They were going over to Justin's house. In shocking yet related news, Justin's parents were out of town. This was going to be a low-key affair, a couple of friends over drinking whatever cheap and or tasty alcohol they could procure, probably end up streaming a movie and pigging out on fast food. She and Justin had a little on-again, off-again thing going. They'd been friends since junior high and undoubtedly, as she joked, Allowing Justin to put his penis in her mouth on a few choice occasions only heightened the bonds of their friendship. He was sweet, and she suspected he was a little infatuated with her. Since guys are obsessed with their dicks, she reasoned, Justin may feel weirdly indebted to her, or maybe he would just have felt that way toward any girl who helped him satisfy that most incessant perennial craving. But she liked that he was too shy or sweet, or both, to ever make any moves on his own. She was in control. He was so understanding, sweet, and... Is grateful the right word? Maybe, but she liked it. She liked having his penis in her mouth, and she liked when he satisfied her, too. She straight up liked it and wasn't afraid to say so. And God bless Rose, her wingwoman. If Karen could take an informal poll at school, she imagined most people would think Rose was the more sexually active of the two, probably because Rose just looked more sexual, taller, leaner, more svelte of face and form. But in fact, they'd be wrong. Rose had the sense of humor of a sailor, but the chasteness of a school chaperone. The most salacious thing she'd ever had in her mouth was a chili cheese dog. Funny. You can't win. Too much sexuality and you're a slut. Too little and you're a cock tease. Rose had been burned by guys who dated her a bit and then cast her off after she'd do nothing more than kiss and feel. Maybe they thought she didn't like them. Maybe their pride had been hurt. Who knows? Karen and Rose talked about this at length. They'd talked about everything at length, and Rose had no moral or religious objections to sex. And, appropriately, no morals or religion whatsoever, she'd once quipped, but just didn't have the desire to get embroiled in sexual high school politics and never found a guy worth the risk. Poor Rose. She was actually eager to experiment, to know and give pleasure, but these local scrubs weren't fitting the bill. Someday. After they'd gotten ready which meant looking a bit more sexified than usual, but without doing anything that brought obvious attention to their efforts, they made their way downstairs. "'You want food? We got pizza left over from last night,' Joan, Karen's mother, offered as they were making their way downstairs. The one set of stairs in the house ended across from the entrance to the kitchen. In other words, when you went down the stairs, the kitchen would be directly before you." You had to turn a left at the bottom of the stairs and turn the corner to head out the front door. If Joan needed to talk to Karen, she made sure to be centrally located in the kitchen. Whether Karen was coming or going to her room upstairs, she had to walk past the kitchen. Is that my Karen wearing perfume? Joan asked as she opened the refrigerator. It smells like flowers. You smell like flowers, not gravestones. At this, Rose doubled over with laughter. 
or something weird, but flowers. No, it isn't perfume. Mom, you know if that day ever comes, you'll be the first to know. And by the way, if you know of a gravestone perfume, then I don't need to tell you what I want for Christmas this year. You're not? Her mom came over and sniffed at her neck and hair while Rose laughed. You smell nice, though. Must be all the patchouli I bathe in. Must be, she said as she whipped Karen playfully with a dish rag. Ah, assaulted by my own mother. Rose, you're a witness. Oh, shush you, Joan continued, emptying out the fruit drawer. Are you sure you don't want to bring a piece of fruit or anything? You didn't eat yet. Eat something good, at least. Or you two could not go out at all. It might rain tonight, you know. Eat something good, like pizza? Karen asked rhetorically. If I was your daughter, I'd love to stay at home and eat pizza. Rose Brown nosed. Oh, I know that, Rose. They must have switched you two at birth. Karen played at exasperation. She hits me and then wishes she had a different daughter. This is what I live with. Oh, boo-hoo. Call me when you come back. Be safe. Don't drink and drive, okay, Rose? You promise me. And even if you do drink, call me. I can pick you up. No drinking and driving. Got that? Karen told Rose. She didn't say anything about doing crack and driving, though. Loophole! Oh, look at you, future lawyer over there, they heard Joan say as they made their way out toward the door. Huh, yeah, right. The closest I'll get to being a lawyer is suing your ass if you try to kick me out of the house. Yeah, let's be honest here. Future lawyer's assistant at best, Rose added as she put her arm around Karen. Karen gave a cheeky Cheshire cat grin. They made their way out to Rose's used Civic, Stanley Civicus, they'd named it, and took off. They had a fun night. Technically, Rose violated her promises to Karen's mother. She both drank and smoked pot, although she only had one beer, purloined from Justin's parents, and only a couple tokes, but there was at least an hour gap between her indulgences and when she drove Karen home. Karen outdid her, smoked pot and had a couple of mixed drinks, mixing together whatever was available. Some vodka ginger ales, why not? There were eight people there in total, and a fun time was had by all. They couldn't stay out too late because it was a school night, and they both had quasi-curfews. Her mom would be pleased. They ordered pizza. They watched some cheesy, softcore, pornified horror movie and just hung out. She spent a little bit of alone time with Justin, just playful chatting, knowing flirtations. She was proud of one of her evocative lines. She told him about the book she just won on Goodreads, written by a supposed cat, and how she looked forward to reading from a pussy. And maybe sometime soon you'll enjoy eating from a pussy, she stated dryly, no unusual intonations, both of them responding with exaggerated oh shit faces. That a promise? he asked. <laughs> well, if it was a super promise, like no matter what, then that'd be rape, my boy. Depends how I feel at the time, but, you know, keep your calendar free is all I'm saying. She came home fifteen minutes shy of her curfew and enjoyed a deep sleep. After a drama-free day at school, guess what awaited her at home? Another one of your junk packages, her mom informed her. Her mom was supportive, but perplexed by her daughter's chosen hobby. A generational thing, she thought that she just didn't get. She didn't get a lot of modern things, but at least with most modern things, she could understand how someone could conceivably enjoy something or what they were supposed to be enjoying about it. These books Karen got were just outrageous junk, attempts to shock. Oh, shit! Karen grabbed the package and noticed the return address. Oh, this guy lives in Woonsocket. He's next door. Better give him a good review. He could be huge one day. I could be launching the career of a hometown hero. Of course, they both knew that no one got famous writing the shit that Karen reviewed. She opened the manila packaging, and what could she say? She was impressed. 
The book was a handsome and hefty trade paperback. She checked the back of the book. Jeez, 200 plus pages. Although she did note the text was probably size 14 font. This couldn't be cheap to produce. The cover was of... What was it exactly? A black cartoon dildo juxtaposed next to a picture of a strange animal that looked like a woolly quadruped with a pig-like snout. The animal picture was ripped right off of National Geographic's website. How'd she know it was taken right off National Geographic's website? At the very bottom right of the image, she could see the crunched font copyright. What the hell is the... Ah, this must be the eponymous Aardvark. The title of the collection and the author's stupidly long gnome de plume were both spelled out in the same garish, splattered paint font. She loved, loved, loved new trade paperback books. The almost biomechanical smooth feel of the covers, even the smell of the pulp paper. She clutched the book and ran into her room like a dog absconding with a biscuit. She opened the book to a random page, just exploring it. Ashton Kutcher Slaughter Dance Party, read one title. Brilliant. This book was going to be a hot, tawdry mess. She updated her Goodreads page and added this book to her currently reading list and dove into the introduction. The ASPCA states that 1.4 million cats are euthanized each year. I was supposed to be one of those cats. Quite the lead. Alone, abandoned, no cat mommy to call my own. My siblings ate her upon birth. All selected for adoption. Despite this rap sheet, I had one loved one in the shelter system. My cat man and main squeeze cuddly Malone. Life is never easy. He ended up doing 25 years in the state pen for loitering in litter boxes and aggravated rape. With no one to fend for me, I fended for myself. I taught myself to read, to write, to feel. That's when I was no longer just a cat. I was a cat, spelled with a K, which is like a cat, but with a different spelling that would impress other cats if they knew how to spell. But they don't. Only cats can. And I'm the only cat. Okay, then... She was used to this type of gonzo-style myth-making. How long did this introduction last? She skimmed it and felt fatigued. Jesus, fifteen pages. She skipped five pages of it and found more of the same, with all the standard non-titillating attempts at titillation, violence, non-sequiturs, and spot the references that she half-feared, half-expected. Ashton Kutcher adopted the author at some point, then peed on him and returned him with strict orders to be euthanized. That's why he's targeted in one story, etc. She turned to the story that seemed the most promising, i.e. like an actual real idea. The story of the serial killer who only kills people who use their phones in movie theaters. It was two lines of setup and all payoff. It was in some superhero movie, does it even matter which one anymore? You texting whore. You don't think this money means something to me? What kind of fucking sociopath are you? I paid for these tickets. Do you really not realize how annoying that light is? Really, is that possible? Is that humanly fucking possible? Or do you just not care? Your thug boyfriend isn't here to protect you. He's gone to take a shit instead of listening to the shit coming out of your mouth, I thought as the knife went through the stupid cunt's throat, rivulets of blood flying like my future ejaculate when I'd fantasize about this later with a toaster up my ass. I crushed her dainty fingers with my free hand, breaking her stupid fucking expensive nails too. I did a 360 around her neck with the knife like I was wrapping a Christmas present. I popped her head off like a pie top and put her beaming, blaring smartphone into the stump. Her orifices lit up like a fluorescent jack-o'-lantern. A jack-o'-lantern of death. She skimmed the rest of the story, sighed, then listlessly skimmed some others. They were all tiring and unengaging, 
all pretexts for hate-filled violence, perversions, and shoehorned wackiness. It was boring and tepid. She put the book aside. Oh well. Nonfiction was her go-to palate cleanser, so she fired up her Kindle and returned to her book on the missing colony of Roanoke. It was well-written and informative, and her mind felt lubricated, that in-the-rhythm satiety when your brain is engaged in worthwhile discourse. She thought nothing of the cat book until two days later, when she received a message from the author on Goodreads. Hey, it should have arrived by now. Did you get it? Let me know when you did. Is there any way I can get you to read it sooner? Any way at all? Kitty treats. Ugh. I got it, thanks. Might take me a while to read, but I will someday. Thanks, was her response. She hated writing bad reviews, although she did it if a book was unbearably twee or pretentious, in which case she could be scathing. Despite all the shock factor, Kat's book was typical, run-of-the-mill, boring gonzo stuff. Not very well-written, interesting, or clever. In the pantheon of trashy smut, it was no Raped by the Reptar or I Horbot. Karen hoped he'd just forget about it, but that wouldn't happen. Writers, even junk writers, perhaps especially junk writers, were incredibly eggshelled. Realistically, she hoped to just never write anything about it and that he'd pick up on the hint. If that fails, maybe giving a two-star review and just saying it wasn't for her. Short and sweet. He responded the next day with an okay, and she didn't respond. Before class started, she uploaded two new reviews, including a detailed four-star review for the Roanoke book she spent all night reading and a three-star review for Dive Into Me a short story smut thriller that actually took a little time to develop its two main characters. After uploading the reviews, she tortured herself in the gratifying way she always did, by not permitting herself to check on the status updates and comments the reviews had accumulated until she returned home from school. Finally, the school day was over. She met Rose in the school's parking lot, Rose drove her home almost every day. They had the same extracurricular schedule, meaning they participated in no extracurricular activities, so the timing always worked. Karen's mom was working late, so naturally they got a little bit high, shielded as they were in the cramped, fenced-in pocket of a backyard. Karen and her mother lived in a single-family detached cottage-style home, typical for their neighborhood. She called the neighborhood homes Snugsies, each a small, cute little house for a small, cute little family in the smallest, cutest state in the country. If either of her neighbors ever saw her sneaking in a little reefer with her friend, they never said anything to her mom about it, so she was thankful for that. She was respectful enough to be discreet about it, though. She had that going for her. Nice and pleasantly baked, well done, they called it, Karen and Rose moseyed in from outside, through the snugsy little kitchen, up the stairs, into her bedroom, the snuggiest room in the whole snuggy house. Snuggles, Karen said aloud, in reverie. What? Rose asked, eyes dimmed, feeling pleasure in nothing more than the act of speaking, the pleasure of existing. Check this out. Karen pulled up her Goodreads account. Rose checked it out. Uh, too many comments. Cannot process. Karen alighted both hands in victory. Oh, shit. She'd racked up a bunch of comments and likes on her last review. She opened her inbox. Somehow, the message from Katmandu was the one thing that jumped out at her. I take it no progress on the book yet? By the way, are you rich? Karen groaned loudly. Huh, I guess his book failed to deliver. Karen reached for the book in a stupor and tossed it over to Rose. Take it. You can ghost review it for me. Rose strained to read in Karen's half-lit room. She read aloud from a passage. And I made sure to use the edge of my sharpened blade to pop out the clit, the juiciest and most delectable morsel. 
All was well, as I just ordered in a new shipment of cocktail sauce. Clitz, the successful man's oysters. And that is enough of that, Karen said in a sing-songy cadence. Yeah, definitely. Yikes. Fail. I mean, I don't think a cat could even use a knife. I know, that's the real problem with it, right? Why else do cats have claws? But seriously, it's all like that. True fail. Karen fired off a reply, saying something like, I'm the richest girl in my entire rich town, shoving my riches in everyone's face. I mean, who isn't jealous of the daughter of the overworked single mother who's always afraid of getting laid off from the hospital? I feed off that shit. Cower before me, mortals. Serve me my hamburger helper. And no, I didn't finish your book. Sorry, I just can't right now. Best of luck. Go Bruins. Go Sox. The Rhode Island ones. She turned off the computer and chilled with her friend, which was all she could ask for. She woke up the next day fully rested. She changed most of her clothes but kept on the same black cat socks, just cause. It wasn't until she checked Goodreads that she officially woke up. She was excited. She had eight messages. Except, all but one was from you-know-who. Okay, that's fine. I don't think you had to give me an attitude. I just felt like you had a rich girl attitude is all. I think it's rude to accept a book and not review it as soon as possible, but it's okay. Just do it whenever. The other messages all tended toward indignation. BTW, I paid to send you that book out of my own pocket. Not to make you feel bad, but it's the truth. I don't make any money doing this. I do it for the fans and for the love of it. People think it's all a joke, but it's not. I take this very seriously. How do you respond in the face of seven messages, most of them sent between midnight and 4 a.m.? Answer? You don't. Ignore. Bye-bye. It never even occurred to her to conduct a deep dive of his profile page on Goodreads. The background of his profile page was overlaid with the same tabby cat as before, with the same gash of a Photoshop style smile. She scrolled down to see some of the recent posts. Another bitch ignored me. What you gonna do? Back under the cat house. Going out for the evening. Started another post. Under the heading was a picture, shoulders visible, of him wearing a brown paper bag on his head that looked tightly soldered on. The bag reminded her of when she had to wrap textbooks in brown paper when she was in elementary school. There were drawn-on angular black marker triangles for cat's ears and a roughly drawn black circle, a mini head for his head mask, with black rows of triangles, presumably to resemble chomping teeth, if you were a lenient parent of a particularly lazy and artistically untalented child. He was raising his arms, and, from the color and appearance of his hands, she pictured a lean, wiry white man in his thirties. One other image actually made her do a double take. Most of his face was wrapped in sheer saran wrap, with him making a malevolent O face with just his front top and bottom teeth visible. The saran wrap added an alien viscosity to his appearance that was, given the intensity of his look, pretty damn frightening. She could see his brown eyes, his brown, longish hair, his thin brown eyebrows, his other dominating masculine features, slightly protruding forehead, long neck and pronounced Adam's apple. He was white and in shape. His face was even kinda cute, if taken out of all other context. With a free hand, he was pulling a tuft of his brown hair, viciously. The angle, his face, his partially closed eyes, all made the distress plain to see. This was, uh, suffering for his art? Someone I really respected gave me a shitty review. Fucking all. Feel like shit now. Need to suffer through it and keep going. Read another post, which had some likes and semi-literate comments encouraging him to not get too down and to keep persevering. 
She didn't like looking at other reviews before she did her own, but since there was frankly no chance in hell she'd be reviewing this guy's book anytime soon, she allowed her curiosity to get the better of her. Shocking, largely confused and irritated one- and two-star reviews, with some surprisingly eloquent five-star defenders lambasting the masses for not getting the satire or being too politically correct and squeamish. How can you not love a story where a dog version of Zoe de Chanel is the bad guy who goes by Zoe da Chundel? Seriously, people, get a sense of humor. It's satire. It's making fun of your superficiality, your obsession with celebrities, and taking it to its most outrageous extreme. So it's okay to commodify female sexuality, to pretend to be a nation that hates violence, but glorifies badasses and superheroes? Well. This collection is brave enough to take it all to the extreme, to throw it right in your face. You can't look away. This is the underside of America. All the concealed psychosis laid out for all to see. Nowhere to hide. This is your principal furtively masturbating to the high school yearbook. This is your beloved father figure taking bribes. This is genius. Karen made one last attempt. She read all 20 goddamn pages of the above-referenced story, and no, 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 not for her, or anyone, but particularly not for her. She perused the rest of his profile absentmindedly, eager to log off. One other picture stuck with her. An open refrigerator, top shelf full of Narragansett coffee stouts. God bless Rhode Island and fuck all the haters. Only Nassets and Argonauts, straight from the source, can inspire my mind, read the caption. So, claiming he was from Rhode Island wasn't just fronting. As low stakes as Goodreads seemed, sometimes authors pretended to have something in common with a reviewer to try and curry favor. He did live in Rhode Island, apparently. Unfortunately. The last of his eight messages read, Fine. Actually, I tell you not to read it. You aren't worthy of it, or you're not the right audience for it. Or, in other words, Fuck you, rich girl. Stupid whores. I don't mean literally whores, but people like you. Just goddammit, fuck it. If you aren't going to be supportive, then fuck it. I'll always have Scarlett Johansson and Gillian Anderson and a million other beautiful women to inspire me. Cats get all the pussy, you know. Sorry if that was harsh, but I need to be honest. Her response wrapped up her feelings nicely. Please do not ever contact me again. Already a little jittery with nervous energy, she sent out a text to Justin, inviting him to come over on Friday night from around 10 p.m. to question mark? The question mark was to add to the mystery, but really he had to be gone by 2 a.m., because that's when her mom's double shift ended, and he'd have to hightail it out of there way before she got home. Might as well transfer her nervous energy into something productive, she figured. It took Justin a while to respond. Playing it cool, she figured, although cool was the last word she'd used to describe him, and that was a compliment but he accepted the invitation amidst a flurry of coy emoticons. They were on. Like Donkey Kong, she added unconsciously in Rose's voice, as if they were linked up telepathically. Get out of my mind! Two days away. Yeah. I'll make sure to shower that day, she texted him when he confirmed that he'd come over. Ew, he responded. But even if you don't, you know I still wub you... She sent back a blushing emoticon. They never said anything about love. Maybe that's why he went instead for the satiric misspelling. If she responded positively, maybe he'd work his way up to L-U-V, and more and more permutations until he got to the real thing. Maybe she should have stopped him. Maybe she would. She morally should. It was the right thing to do. She did like him a lot, but they had to be realistic what with college and everything else right on the horizon. Maybe talk about it in person. Texts were not the medium for nuanced explorations of affection. But for now, she liked the inherent promise of protection and trust embedded beneath that unassuming, goofy text. 
She spent the next day blazing through short fiction and uploading some other reviews. The last piece she reviewed deserved three stars for its title alone. You spit out my coffee like you spit out my seed. And, as she declared in her review, for including the following sublime passage containing the typo of the year. The burly barista raised his head and released a yawl of his own as his cock tensed up inside her, ready to explode. Ironic, you're a vegan who needs my meat to live. He teased Candy, the cute new hire. Mm-hmm, I can't wait to unleash this new product. Small batch, limited release. Only available here, he said, and pointed to his throbbing balls. His thick cock twitched inside her. She felt it contract and spurt hot liquid deep into her worm. Her worm! Classic. She let the likes and comments accumulate as she poured over He Who Shall Not Be Named's Goodreads profile. Recusing herself from the obligation of reviewing his work was freeing. She now took an almost anthropological interest in this guy. She was fascinated. It took a lot for her to block someone on the site. Hell, she didn't think she actually blocked anyone before, and half the messages in her inbox were lewd inducements. If she could be assured he wasn't batshit insane, she'd want to interview him. His profile page was filled with so much rambling, so much… confused anguish juxtaposed and interspersed with these fucking cat and celebrity references. The fuckfest, birth, death, and birth again of Kitty Perry began a recent blog post of his that caused her eyes to blaze over. Jesus, what a sordid little world she stepped into. Katmandu evidently had a particularly nasty streak of engaging in vindictive flame wars with hostile reviewers which perhaps accounted for the downtick in takers for his collection. She saw another online contest of his, offering three copies of his collection, with only 38 current bidders. Holy shit, Rose said. It was Friday around 4pm, and Karen and Rose were chilling, planning on grabbing dinner and chatting about Karen's night to come. Rose was surfing the Psycho's Goodread page, I am fascinated. I want to subscribe to his newsletter. He is crazy. He's a work of art. If a car crash could turn into a human being and write, it'd be him. If he's obsessed with cats, why is the book named after an aardvark? I never read enough to find out. My loss. I imagine there's some stupid coda or postscript buried in the back. Something like, Ha ha, you stupid faggot, you read all this and there's not even an aardvark story. Some things should just remain mysteries. I'm borrowing this. She flipped through the book, put it in her school bag, and returned to his profile page. Easier to put it in her school bag than keep it on Karen's desk, where it might get swallowed up by the voracious clutter. Make sure to read the story about the unlucky guy who shits out melting crap babies. Oh, as if you needed to tell me. I wish we still did book reports in school. Rose shook her head in something like befuddled awe as she poured over his profile page. Is there a way to get access to his Goodreads page without actually signing up for Goodreads? I'll admit it, I'm hooked. He actually might be cute. Or cute-ish. Hard to tell below all the crazy. He promises a big announcement tonight. I'm not embarrassed to admit I'll probably look online to see what it is. Okay, so maybe I'm a little embarrassed. I'm sure I'll be blocking you from Goodreads soon, Sally Stalker. Come on, let's go. They were going out to Rizzo's Fine Italian, about 20 minutes away, which, despite the chintzy name, was actually pretty good. Are you going to wear that tonight? Rose asked, with a trace of friendly skepticism. Karen wasn't one to get insecure, especially not about fashion but she wasn't a robot, damn it. What's wrong with this? She wore a tight-fitting, soft black sweater with a singular, oversized button at the top as a flourish, paired with black skinny jeans. I think you'll find it hot, tight-fitting. She leaned in mock seductively. Should I have more décolletage? She pronounced in a husky sotto voice. 
He's seen my boobs before. He'll want to unwrap them in this. Don't deny him his fun. No, you crazy person, Rose spoke as they made their way from Karen's room down to the living room toward the door. You wore that shirt this week. I remember it, you slob. Aren't you trying to get sort of laid tonight? Up your game. Joan had already left earlier this afternoon for her double shift, so they were free to profane and slut talk all night. She shrugged. Eh, he's a guy. I doubt he noticed. Shit, I don't even remember. She wouldn't admit it now, but she resolved to change when she got home. Rizzo's was in fine form that day. Karen got the penne vodka, which always sounded fancy but totally isn't. Rose got the veal cutlet. You heartless bitch, Karen teased. And, as Karen was prone to saying, a good time was had by all. It was around 8.30pm when they got back to Karen's house. She wished she'd left the light on. She always hated returning to an entirely darkened home. She was glad Rose was still with her, even though, of course, she'd have to skedaddle soon. They went into the house and turned on all the lights. The old home groaned. All its organs hissed to life as Karen adjusted the temperature. So, do you want me to leave now for your little date? Does it take some time to prime your vagina up or something? Just blowing the dust off. Easy peasy. Ha. Karen mock dusted her shoulder. I think it's probably more like... Rose began, and blew hard on one hand while using the other hand to convey massive amounts of dust flying up into the atmosphere. Karen laughed, said, Yeah, right, and then there was a brief silence. Karen, for some reason, felt a twinge of sadness, something about the dark quietude of autumn. She was so over this cold weather bullshit. Everything looked so sparse and dead. She didn't admit this much, but she hated being alone, especially when she was waiting for something to happen. The night had a way of settling uncomfortably upon her. She was glad she wasn't alone. Now, nah, Rose, it's you. You stay. If it was anyone else, I'd tell him to leave, but you... Come on, Rose, you... You can stay. Stay until, like, 9.45. Psych me up. She thought about asking what the rest of Rose's night might have in store, but didn't. Rose plopped down on the living room couch, feet up on the ottoman. Karen wanted to pass this off as nonchalantly as possible, so as not to give Rose the satisfaction. So, I'm gonna go upstairs for a couple minutes. To change? Yes, you bitch, to change. Are you happy? Ecstatic. With that... Rose pivoted her feet from the ottoman and took up the whole couch. It was a small couch, only intended for two, after all, and Rose's long legs peeked over the side. She whipped out the damned book and adjusted the light behind her. Take your time. This'll keep me company. Rose held the book before her with outstretched arms and gave the book a deep, sinister voice jostling and spinning it as if it was possessed, as if its demonic voice was so powerful it caused the whole book to quake. Wahahaha, fear me, Karen, fear me! Cute. Have fun with that. Any suggestions, by the way, on what I should wear? Your purple dress that shows off your rack. Noted. That dress had a funky odor to it that needed to be addressed. Probably a pass. Karen made her way upstairs to her bedroom and looked at herself in the mirror. Hmm. She liked the way she looked in tight sweaters. Goth librarian. Hmm. Maybe just a different sweater? She was something of a sweater head. She checked her phone to see if there were any messages. Nope. She plugged it in with the charger by the bed, the power juice, and debated whether to text Justin just to make sure he was still coming. She hadn't heard from him in a while. She relented, texted, See you soon at 10 p.m., and then was ashamed. Deeply, deeply ashamed. Patience, dear. She took her sweater off, exploring how she looked in her plush purple bra. Should we wear a purple sweater over it? With black pants? Yeah, sure. Typical, but for a reason. Hmm... 
Rose wished the lighting in the living room was better. There was a standing lamp and two less-than-optimal bulbs on the ceiling that emitted hazy, dirty light. Why do dim bulbs even exist anymore? She knew so little about technology and science, she thought to herself, that she could read about an amazing discovery on one of those clickbait sites that just described the operation of a standard light bulb, and she'd probably be amazed and send it around with the subject line, Science is awesome! She laughed to herself and thought about how to explain the thought to Karen. If Karen was around, Rose would probably stay reserved and not allow her mean to register her unease with what she was reading. She'd just joke it off, be flippant about it. Karen actually gave out her home address to this psychopath? The smell of his inner organs made my cock hard, knowing he was dead, that they were all dead. My cock got fully hard, and like usual, I got momentarily dizzy because, as I mentioned before, my cock is like 10 inches. My super cock folded onto itself in a corkscrew like Tigger's tail, and I used it to bounce up and down. Cats don't yell at the moon, but holding that faggot's intestines called for something special. Sproing, sproing, sproing. I bounced on my corkscrewed dick, which pounded a deeper and deeper hole into the earth with each bounce. I wrapped the intestines around my neck like I was Jake the fucking snake and it was 88, and other things that kinda rhymed. I put a warm piece of the awful under my balls because that felt nice, and fuck it, this was my time to shine. There was a little footnote next to Faggot's Intestines, which read, As I mentioned, to those who don't listen, I don't have anything against gay people. My cousin's gay, actually, but I like the way the word sounds, and I like pissing people off. Scanning the book would become her new M.O. She wanted to find that damn aardvark story. Karen, still in her purple bra, kept quiet and listened to the sounds of her house. Been a couple of minutes, and Justin had never responded. Don't be like that. Come on. She pretended to just be killing some time online, but also hoped he'd affirm the plans in the next couple of minutes. He was the eager, horny one, after all, i.e., the guy. Naturally, she went to Goodreads, and it was only a couple of minutes until she ended up on Guess Who's profile. That was the gift she'd gotten from all of this. She'd always have the crazy, psycho, catman do to cyberstalk. The tables have turned, mofucker! When the lines of communication were open, he'd been kinda scary. Now that they were officially closed, tracking him became fascinating. He had a new post. You pretentious assholes will like this. It's a prose poem. It's my first time doing a prose poem, so bear with me. I'll probably read, definitely, be gone from Goodreads and life itself. Is Goodreads life itself? Just remember, whatever they say about me isn't true, unless it's a positive thing, and then it's definitely true. And by the way, my stories will, from now on until forever, be free on Kindle and Nook and all that other shit. That's so I can profit off my crimes, at least in terms of exposure. And if they get removed from the online places, just know that I'll soon be famous and I'm sure they'll be available to find. I have Dylan Klebold's story on my computer, for example. So anyway, here goes. Your mommy worked at a hospital. What rhymes with hospital? Unstoppable. Note I say worked, past tense. Too bad for mommy, you were dense. The work I showed her was too intense. But there's nothing left of her but stench. But stench? Butt stench. Plus, I pissed down her throat and it spilled out the slit. Mommy said she loved you. And there was a picture of him, this time in a flinty matte cardboard mask with holes cut out for the eyes. She could practically see the double-duty rubber band around the back of his head which held up the mask. A dot nose with three curved lines on each side for whiskers and a frenetic O of a mouth were drawn on in what looked like blue pen. She could see two blue triangular shapes on his head. Ears, she presumed. It was obviously a selfie. 
From the looks of it, he was taking the picture with his right hand. He was leaning into the picture, and his face took up the right side of the frame. He offered his upturned left hand to the camera as if in supplication. It was thoroughly covered in what was intended to be blood. It's like he dipped his whole left hand and even part of his arm in red, clotting paint. There was something else in his left hand, but it was too low resolution to really make it out. It was rectangular and silver, reminded her of a Monopoly piece. Life experience told her it looked like a name tag, like the one her mom wore while she was on nursing duty. The picture looked like it was taken inside a car, she figured. He was leaning on seats. The post was timestamped at 7.23 p.m., posted today. She checked her phone. No response yet from Justin. It was 8.54 p.m. She had the urge to text her mother, something simple, something both loving and friendly, but didn't. She wanted her phone charged. She popped open her bedroom door and yelled down the stairs, Hey, Rose! Rose! Come up here for a second. I'm in a bra. You're in luck. Come on up here. No response. She hated the stillness in the house. She moved and shifted just to feel some activity, get her blood moving, as if her heart wasn't already beating out of her chest and she was doing her best to ignore it. Hey, Rose! She made her way downstairs without turning the corner. She peeked around the corner because she was still in her bra, even though she had no shame about it whatsoever and usually couldn't care less. She could see the empty kitchen before her and, through the kitchen's glass window, the pocket-sized backyard where they'd last gotten high. She felt vaguely nostalgic, and then vulnerable. She should go change, but wanted to hear Rose's voice first. She turned the corner, entered the living room, and saw it was fully lit, Rose sitting and reading on the couch. Yo, what's good? Rose looked up at her. Nice tatas. Save them for tonight. Karen entered and bore witness to an alien visage. Rose was talking casually and normally, as if there was supposed to be someone standing right behind her, like it was no big deal. Like Karen was the crazy one for holding her breath and wondering what in the fucking hell was going on. Karen froze, waiting for an explanation, not processing exactly what she was witnessing. Rose, what's going on? Rose looked at her quizzically, still imbued with her usual sass. She couldn't parse the sheer bewilderment that was Karen's face. She followed Karen's eyes and turned her head around looked up to see what was behind her. Her widened dinner plate eyes. Shock. Shock. She was shocked, and there was no explanation. A figure in cat ears and a paper plate mask. Karen? A serrated blade plunged into the area where Rose's neck and chest met. What came out was only a muffled, gasping wheeze mixed with gargling. She reached her hand out to Karen, her expression raw with panic. She fell backward onto the couch, almost in the same position she'd been in when she'd been just killing time reading. He raised the bloodied knife in the air and brought it down squarely through her neck, with such force that it pierced through her throat and came out the other end, burrowed deep into the cushions of the couch. The masked man steadied his left hand on Rose's shoulder and jerked the knife out of her neck with his right. In that instant, Karen noticed so many things, all fighting for primacy in her brain, overwhelming her. How the torque of the knife pulling had two distinct motions, first removing the knife from the innards of the couch, then removing the knife from the gape of Rose's neck. That he was wearing a light green, almost puke green, down jacket, with the hood halfway up. He didn't pull the hood up so I can see his cat ears. He was a bit taller than she expected. Taller than six feet, maybe six two. Definitely much taller than her, and built lean. He stared at her from beneath the paper plate mask, and she couldn't see the details of the mask. But who fucking cares? Why was her brain trying to see it? Run. Run. Run! 
While never breaking eye contact, he lodged his left thumb into Rose's pulsing wound to tear it open even more. He did it casually with no sense of urgency, like he was feeling for change under a couch cushion. Her brain filled in the sound of Velcro, of cheap leather, tearing. The enervating compression of her nerves was over. Karen turned on a dime and ran toward the kitchen behind her. Her legs got the better of her and they quite literally galloped over each other, tripping her up and sending her gliding toward the floor, but she caught herself and pressed on. Five long strides and she was in the kitchen. She reached toward the wall by the refrigerator in an almost phantom panicked hallucination, imagining her grandmother's heavy, corded phone she could use to smash him over the head. But that phone was long gone, a product of another time, an innocent, unfathomable era now. No phone, not a weapon, phone upstairs, think, think, think. Interspersed through the explosive panic was a flat memory of her mother talking on a phone in the kitchen, something jejun, cruelly bobbing up from the swamp of her memory as if it was something noteworthy. Snap out of it, focus, get a knife, a pot, a weapon. He was running toward her, briskly, muscularly, with grim efficiency. When he crossed the threshold of the kitchen, he pounced in what could only be described as a delirious skipping. She evaded and jolted open the refrigerator door on instinct. He ran right into it. He made a noise that she recognized to be artificial, insincere. It was almost a laugh, an exaggerated joke noise, as if he was just nothing but a light-hearted buffoon. The effect was disorienting, as she was still in shock, and some part of her wanted to pretend this was all an act, not real, that there was someone watching this about to yell, scene, or cut, and put an end to this. He overcompensated for the abrupt, painful disturbance in his movement and fell forward, landing partly on the kitchen table. He cursed, sharply, in a way that punctuated illusions and fantasies of mercy. Karen frantically opened the utensils drawer next to her for a cooking knife. She grabbed her mother's fancy Wustoff cooking knife and turned toward her attacker in double time. She turned just in time. He was running at her as if he planned on tackling her, but stopped just before he did, flexed his knees to mimic a strike, and then swung high. His feint worked. She'd instinctively taken firm root and readied herself to handle the tackle and stick him with the knife, and processed the newfound need to duck too late. Instead, as if a compromise, she dodged her head backward, but not far enough. A cruel notch of the serrated blade caught a meaty chunk off her left cheek. It tore effortlessly, and the gore flowed down her face like it was actively fleeing from her. In the span of a few seconds, the blood was flowing down her face and pooling in the crevice of her clavicle, sticky and hot on her exposed flesh. His left palm pawed at her left cheek sharply. His knife careened back toward her face in a backward slash. She ducked and thrust her hand forward, stabbing with the knife, which, thank God, her mother had always kept sharp. Mother, mother, dead mother, don't let the knife go dull on the pots and pans. And he was quick. Like a cat, quick like a cat. She wasn't sure how he'd parried the blows, but he had. She slid back to gain some distance from him. They stood off from each other, him pivoting and fainting, her eyes locked on his movements, both holding their weapons in their right hands. He held his knife firmly, resolutely. Her hand was too choked up on the handle. Ludicrously, she copied his knife holding, intuiting that he knew more about this than she. They were only a few steps apart, or perhaps one hard lunge. Her entire body was an electrified pole of nerves, squaring off, and just before he made a decisive move toward her, she reached her free left hand behind her, felt a pot, and launched it at his head. She was a good throw, and if he hadn't ducked, it would have conked him square on the head. As he ducked, she bolted past him. God, let Rose be alive and be here to help me kill him! But she knew, just knew, 
that there no longer was a rose, just a sticky, long, lumpen shape on the couch. Upstairs to phone, lock the door, call police, run straight out the door, run to the neighbors, get help! Rocketed through her brain in the short span of her sprinting. The stairs were closer, just outside the kitchen, so she ran up them in galloping leaps without thinking, on instinct, no time for consideration. She was halfway up the stairs when it seemed as if gravity itself upended her. She fell hard on her chin. He had caught her by the foot and pulled. All she thought as she fell was, Please don't let me kill myself with my own knife. But she didn't. It remained under her control in her right hand, which she'd intuitively extended away from her body. She turned to kick, and the leverage was perfect. She kicked him, crunch, directly on the bridge of the mask's nose. He was caught off balance and rocketed through the air down the length of the stairs, landing squarely on his back without hitting a single stair to break his fall. Please, God, let him land on his own knife and impale himself. She thought as she turned and ran up to her room, slammed the door, and locked it. It only had one lock, one of those doorknob locks that prevented the knob from turning. She pushed her desk, computer and all, to add heft to the locked door. She put her dresser on the pile too, all her junk. Locked door, desk, dresser, heap mountain. He couldn't possibly hack through all that, force that all out of his way. The phone. Where's my phone? She felt in a panic for her phone cord in the wall and followed it to its end. No phone. Must have fallen off in the scramble, swallowed by the great heap. By some miracle of heaven, her lizard brain detected a sharp, bluish light under the mass by her locked door, forced her toward the object, and yes, it was her phone. It was already on. She unlocked it and dialed 911. I'm calling the cops, you fucking... you fucking maniac! She yelled without thinking. Maybe he didn't know you were in your room and you just gave it away. She thought in a half second of fear, but his voice from the hallway made it a moot point. You were already in a bra for me! You were ready for me! His voice was high-pitched and squeaky, a nightmare Mickey Mouse. Nuts for you! I'm going to fuck your dead friend and leave! Bye-bye! Don't write! Help me! There's a murderer in my house, he has a knife, and he killed my friend and my mother, and he's trying to kill me! She spoke urgently but coherently to the operator on the other end of the line. She gave her address, the most important information she knew to give. Again and again, she gave her address. Help was a few minutes away. It was a turning point for her, and she fought the buildup of mucus and tears. Help was on the way. Help was on the way. She put on her purple sweater, and the moment it took to do that was agony. She made the dispatcher keep talking, couldn't pry herself from the sound of salvation for even the moment it took her to put on the sweater. Her sweater being on felt symbolic. Relief. Comfort. Boyfriend is here! She heard from the hallway, again in that insane nightmare parody of what a crazed Mickey Mouse might sound like. This time, there was a little strain to the impersonation. There was a bit of an underlying baritone, what was probably closer to his regular voice, maybe for effect, maybe for volume. He course-corrected in what he said next. I can't wait to meet him, he said in a yippy-skippy screech that could break glass. Still on the phone, she opened her blinds and looked outside. There was a car, headlights on, pulling into her driveway. She now realized the red flashing light of her phone, which signaled she'd received a text message, but she didn't dare do anything to disconnect herself from 911. She opened the window inartfully. Something about the cool night air made her feel sick. She almost threw up, but held her composure. It was Justin. He was still in his car, the top floor of her house wasn't too far off the ground, and she could see him perfectly fine. There was Justin waiting in the driver's seat, maybe tapping the steering wheel impatiently, maybe consternation across his face. No way to tell. Intuition filled in the visual lapses. 
He was definitely reaching for something, probably his cell phone to call her. She waved her hands and yelled, Go, Justin! Get out of here! Run! Get out of here! She banged loudly on the top interior of her window. At no point did she contemplate leaving the sanctity of her boarded-up bedroom. That would be suicide, tempting fate. Please hear me, please hear me. She continued banging and yelling. Please hear me, please hear me. Justin, drive! Get help! Get out of here! There was pounding, a tilting almost, of noise in the hallway behind her. Something or someone running at full speed. No, Justin, please, God, don't come in here. But no, it wasn't him. He was still in the car. She tucked the thought away. The window was now raised all the way. She made a funnel with her hands, still holding the knife, which she kept jutted outward away from her body, and yelled with all her might, Justin! She felt her phone vibrate again and knew it must be him calling, but she refused to hang up with 911. She was staying on the phone until help damn well arrived. She felt the sense impression of kinetic motion and an explosion of panicked, frayed thought. She was barricaded in this room. He couldn't get in. Think. Stay calm. Let him run around, try and scare her, psych her out. Why didn't she hear him outside her door? Where was he? She didn't see him by Justin's car, didn't see any shapes running outside. She thought to grab something from her desk and throw it at Justin's car to get his attention. Justin was at least smart enough, or cold enough, to stay in his car. Her mind was still racing a mile a minute, and she couldn't put her mental finger on it, but there was something she was overlooking. I love you, Mom. A deep, welling sadness opened up within her chest. Rose, I love you too. Please don't let him be desecrating their bodies, or my mother's room. Mother's room. Something about mother's room. Location. Rooms faced the same side. Windows faced the same side. She leaned out the window slightly and looked toward her mother's window. A faint but conspicuous light was on. A desk lamp, she conjectured. She panicked again, looked down in a panic. What if he's below me, throws a knife up at me? She escapes only to die carelessly, a knife flung into her throat. Out of the corner of her eyes, she saw movement and a human shape, with awkward determination, launch itself toward her. He'd been lurking in the windowsill from her mother's room. He wasn't at an angle to leap directly into her room. He came from the side, but both his hands were flailing, a whirlwind of movement, and his free left hand grabbed wildly at her hair and latched on. Gravity should be pulling him down, taking him away, but between his fistful of her hair and the insane, rabid contortions of his body, he was getting a foothold. She pushed his face down, going for the eyes, but his face was wrapped in something like padded paper, almost like a reinforced diaper. She reached out to gouge his eyes and hooked with her thumb, but only felt this bizarre material that gave no clue as to what she was touching. He held on, and she saw his knife come down and registered she should do something, but it was too late. It pierced through her sweater into the blubber of her upper left breast, and she screamed. She was going to die. To have her heart ripped from her chest in full view of the street, in full view of Justin, in full view of the police. She had done everything right, only to fuck it up when help might be arriving in just a few minutes, pulling defeat from the jaws of victory. She bled and cried. For her, for Rose, for her mother, for everything that was cruel and evil. He pulled back to strike again, but she grabbed his right wrist and pinioned it to her chest. She felt one of his digits invade the cut in her chest, the open, sacred space of her body, one digit, maybe two, like he was doing nothing more than ripping a blockage out of a stubborn drain. She propelled herself forward, out the window. 
He intertwined with her and fell too, positioned right below. She pushed his hand out of the way but feared beyond all fear that she would land straight on, be impaled by his knife. No! In those fleeting moments, thinking nothing of the pain that would greet her upon impact, grass and pine chips will break the fall. She thought only of the logistics of bringing her knife down into his head, as if she were slicing nothing more than a block of cheese. There was the crunch of their bodies and a profound dislocation and disconnection. The relationship between her right leg and the rest of her body had changed. It felt like it crumbled into itself, that she was now somehow no longer bipedal. She couldn't move it. He was still beneath her, groaning and kinetic, alive, but operating slowly. She had largely used his body to cushion her fall. She heard sirens in the background and the rumble of approaching vehicles. She heard the click of a car door open and the slam of it closing. Justin's voice yelling her name for several moments, getting closer. She rolled over, blotting out the world, catatonic. Tharn, she thought, a fantasy word she read in a children's book used to describe rabbits that had become so paralyzed with fear and anxiety that they'd stop moving stop functioning. Tharn. Justin rushed down toward her, taking a knee. She felt his hands on her shoulder, helping her up. She registered that his knee partially landed on and pinched her nose, one of those sharp, frustrating pains that might be funny in other circumstances, klutzy, uncoordinated Justin. Justin lifted her slightly to her side. Karen, are you... And the next thing she knew, there was a horrifying squishing noise and an abortive inhalation. Justin, still on his knees, looked up at the sky and landed on his back, a knife lodged securely in his gut up to the hilt. Not my knife! Not my knife! She flexed and pumped her hand. Yes, her hand was not broken. She could feel it. Yes, she had locked her fingers tight. Yes, she was holding her knife. Rose's murderer had rolled out from under her in her days and shoved his knife into Justin's gut. Her mother's murderer was pushing his knife deeper and deeper, putting his whole body into it, as Justin, poor Justin, gasped without sound, the only sound the barely perceptible wet suction of Justin's gut wound being torn further open. She screamed, lunged, grabbed the psycho's shoulder and twisted him around, where he sprawled onto the ground before her. Her probing fingers felt a wetness that she knew came from his body, from an injury he must have sustained from the fall. Nothing. That would be nothing. A paper cut. Nothing. Compared to what she had planned for him. She was screaming. She thrust the knife from behind her shoulder, stabbing down, down, down into her tormentor's face, pushing him down, 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 down into hell. The blade went straight through the waxy, padded paper covering his face. She stabbed again, and again, and again. The tip of her knife intuited a slit for eyes, and she took the blade by the hilt, steady with both hands, and raised it to the sky, malevolent thoughts of how the Aztecs ripped out human hearts, and brought the sharp blade straight through his eye, straight through his head, into the yielding earth. She stopped only because the knife was stuck, a railroad spike. Karen folded upon herself, passing out, worrying crazy things about her vanity, being cold and only a bra, then before losing consciousness, remembering she was wearing a sweater. She wanted to reach out to Justin, touch him, help him, but she couldn't. Tharn. There was a great rushing of bodies, swarming and sirens, and she didn't exactly pass out, but was somewhere else when she was put onto a stretcher and lifted like soft magic into the back of an ambulance. 
The following months were... not a blur. No, that wasn't right. How to describe it? It's like she'd been placed on a gentle raft bobbing down a slow-moving but implacable river. Where she'd end up, she didn't know. How she ended up there, she couldn't conceive of. Where she had come from, the story of her bygone days, she could still see dimly, but each day, the reality of her new situation became less and less deniable. She held on to her memories of her mother, her memories of Rose, and amplified them, magnified them a million times, took intentional chunks of time to do nothing but think of them as full, important, sacred human beings, mythic totems almost. It turned out that neither she nor Rose had thought to lock the front door, a fact mentioned ad nauseum by anonymous social media commentators. But why would she? It was a safe neighborhood. People make mistakes. God, she'd imbibed the social media discussion threads so thoroughly that she replayed them in her daydreams. Her injuries were relatively minor. She'd fractured her right leg jumping out the window and was left with two deep scars, one on her breast and the other, the more garish scar, on her cheek. Quite the badass, she imagined Rose would say. She hated the scar because it reminded her of nothing but abject cruelty. The serrated crocodile's teeth of that knife left her cheek ridged, looking like plowed earth. It served no purpose other than to disfigure and destroy. Justin recovered relatively well. He too had a ghastly scar, though it always remained hidden under whatever he wore. He did, however, walk with an almost truncated gait and had to reconcile himself to a host of abdominal and intestinal problems. She and Justin kept in touch, but rarely saw each other for reasons they never fully explored. Although to Karen, the mention of his name was concomitant with flooding waves of shame, guilt, and anguish, and no doubt the sentiment was mutual. She also did her best to avoid, as much as she could, the history of Jeffrey Melville, a.k.a. the obviously pseudonymed Katmandu, or Jeff the Shotgun Shell, or Jeff the Whirlwind, destroyer of cities from New York to Berlin. He suffered no scarcity of nom de plumes. He had more nom de plumes and online aliases than publication credits, more than anything else, really. She resisted poring over the breaking news articles and trashy tabloid spreads that brought news reporters to a frenzy, but one can only resist so much, for there were always dark nights of the soul, where you have too much to drink and you binge and you indulge, for no other reason than to quell your curiosity or to smother vexing feelings of anxiety and uncertainty. So, she read up bits and bobs, never finishing a full article about him. He was 34. He lived in a small studio in an unappealing part of Woonsocket, Rhode Island. He was estranged from his family. He had idolized his older brother, but the affection went unrequited. He worked on and off as a custodian and as an air conditioner repairman. Colleagues called him a good worker, but erratic, and he'd inevitably get fired for talking back, tardiness, or just plain no-showing. He kept an intimate journal that spoke of nightmarish things. He vacillated between mild self-deprecation and intense seriousness. He firmly believed he was destined for better things. He was bilious toward people who rejected his writings or dismissed it as juvenilia, and dropped friends who questioned him or gave him unsolicited writing advice. At some point in his journals, he resolved to kill in a wild, elaborate, and hysterical way. He died wearing a mask made out of a diaper. He took selfies with the corpses of her mother and Rose. She saw one of the latter, just for a second, on a terrible website called Best Gore, where he stared ironically dead-faced into the camera as if he didn't know the tendons and viscera of her beautiful friend's open neck was fully on display just above his shoulder. And her face, God, 
her face. Cadaverous. Still beautiful, always beautiful. But those dead, sunken eyes. The radiance of them. Gone. She'd looked at the picture for a moment. The picture had been labeled as the crazed cat killer's last selfie, but the website hadn't mentioned that there'd be a corpse in the background. But perhaps a website calling itself Best Gore didn't hold itself to the highest journalistic standards, Phantom Rose would have said. And, oh God, no, never again. He had typed a long-winded suicide note where he looked forward to better things. The letter became irreverent and manic whenever it risked seeming treacly. As promised, he'd uploaded his story collection to various marketplaces and offered it for free. One night, over a year later, she looked up the collection online and found hundreds of ratings, reviews, and discussions. On Kindle, it was one of the top 50 most downloaded items in the free anthology category. There were links to Reddit and 4chan that she left unopened. There was even fan art. She ignored it. She pretended otherwise. But it was there. There was a whole universe that had been created that clicked and churned ceaselessly. You've been listening to Soon Enough, This Will Essentially Be a True Story by J.R. Hamantaschen. J.R. Hamantaschen is a writer of short stories, having released several collections, including A Deep Horror That Was Very Nearly Awe, With a Voice That Is Often Still Confused But Is Becoming Ever Louder and Clearer, and You Shall Never Know Security. JR also co hosts a horror podcast called The Horror of Nachos and Hamantaschen. You can find collections of his work at Velux Books, www.veloxbooks.com. Well, my friends, that ends our episode tonight. I must say, I agree with J.R. Hamantaschen that Karen's run-in with Katmandu is far closer to reality than fiction. The internet is a large, strange place, and any online interaction carries its risks, especially for women. I spend a decent amount of time reading stories from and contacting online authors, and have been lucky enough to never have an interaction go this horribly but I still think I'll refrain from giving out my home address. Thank you again to JR and Velux Books for letting us feature this story tonight. I'm sure we'll see more of JR's work on the show in the future, and in the meantime, be sure to come back next week for more frightening fables to chill your bones. Until then, listener, stay spooky. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Tonight's episode was hosted and narrated by yours truly, Eric Peabody. Original music provided by Eric Peabody and Nikki McSorley. Finalization by N.M. Brown and S.K. Brown.
tales for dark nights.